Okay, uh, the booklet. Why a booklet and not a book? Uh, because Einstein himself referred to this little book as a Büchlein very often. And therefore, uh, following in his footsteps, we refer to it as a booklet. The popular, I mean, that is uh, this, in the title, you see Gemein Verständlich, generally understood. And uh, uh, this lecture is based on a study uh, that we performed jointly with Jürgen Ren last year uh, when we decided that it would be appropriate to have a centennial edition of this classical booklet and that we would add a few comments and act like ordinary editors. But very soon we found out is that the challenge to do something appropriate is much greater than we initially intended. Uh, this is a very unique document, uh, not only in the history of the Einstein scholarship, and we believe that it did not get the attention that it deserves in the Einstein scholarship, as I shall try to demonstrate to you. It is also a very unique document in the history of science, uh, both in terms of its contents, method of presentation, uh, the stories behind the dissemination of this booklet in many different countries, the role it played in Germany and outside in the public debates about relativity, uh, the role it played in the process of reception of relativity, and also the role it played in the process of Einstein's own crystallization of his own ideas. So, uh, therefore, we uh, were not just satisfied with the few commentaries, but turned it into a major uh, project. Now, the uh, Einstein's photo that you see here is an etching by Hermann Struck, who was a renowned etcher in Berlin in the early 20s. When Einstein visited Palestine in 1923, Hermann Struck already lived in Haifa, and Einstein visited him there. And today in Haifa, there is a Hermann Struck museum. Now, shortly after uh, Einstein wrote in November uh, 1915 four papers, November 7th, November 11th, November 18th, and November 25th, submitted them to the Prussian Academy, Royal Academy of Science, and thereby completed his general theory of relativity, he sat down to write a comprehensive review for the scientific community. And at that time, he was already thinking about doing something popular. And in a letter to his friend, colleague, Michel Bissot, he wrote that this great success of general relativity that pleased him a lot, uh, uh, and he seriously considered writing a book in the near future on special and general uh, relativity theory. Uh, if I do not do so, the theory will not be understood as simple though it basically is. Now, you should keep in mind that 1916 was one of the busiest years in Einstein's scientific life. First, he had to complete this manuscript, this publication on the general theory of relativity. Then he had a very extensive correspondence with colleagues, sharing with them his immense satisfaction with the success of completing the general theory of relativity. Then he wrote this book or booklet. And in the midst of everything, he also published two 
one of the most seminal papers that he ever published, and those are the papers on the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and matter that gave rise to these, uh, to, that explained a spontaneous absorption, a spontaneous emission, absorption, the Einstein coefficient. And at the end of that, of those papers, he wrote another letter to Michel Besso telling him light quanta are now established. So he published this booklet, the early 1917, and he was not happy with the result. And another letter to Besso. You see, I am already quoting three letters to Besso, but Besso correspondence was not on Bia Diana's uh, this round chart of, of, uh, uh, of people he corresponded with, and expresses here some disappointment with the result. But in spite, in spite of uh, his self-criticism, this booklet had tremendous success. Within five years, there were 14 editions in German. And uh, after the war, in 1947, Einstein was approached again by his publisher, the Fiveck Company, suggesting to him to produce another edition, that it is appropriate now to produce another edition after the war. As you will hear, there is a renaissance in the interest in general relativity. Uh, but then he responded in a sharp letter, two sentences, one of them saying, after the mass murder of my Jewish brethren by the Germans, I do not wish any of my publications to be issued in Germany. It had to wait seven more years until he changed his mind. And in 1954, he did approve another, the last in his lifetime, edition of, uh, of general, uh, of, this, of this booklet. Now, after the confirmation of the prediction of the bending of light, there appeared the first English edition, and immediately following that, there were a number, an avalanche of foreign language editions. Now we have English, French, Italian, Japanese, Polish, Russian, Spanish, Hungarian, Chinese, Czech, and Hebrew. And I'm quoting only the publications in the 20s. And I shall say, I, actually, I shall devote a great part of my talk to discussing these special editions and the role they played on the reception, in the reception or debates about general relativity in the respective countries. After, uh, from the 50s until today, you have many more. You have Arabic, Armenian, Bulgarian, Croatian, and until today, all these editions, by the way, all these publications were followed by new printings, new editions. For example, the Japanese one, which is mentioned here, there were six editions within one month of the first publication. That was the interest in this, in this booklet. Uh, this year, uh, the staff of our archives have been approached by a Vietnamese publisher, by a Slovenian publisher, and I don't know who, and I don't know uh, who else. Uh, in 1921, there were also initiatives and inquiries about translations into Croatian, Latvian, Estonian, Ukrainian, Yiddish, Hebrew, and even a Braille script edition. Now, uh, in the case of Yiddish and Hebrew, Einstein himself, actually his stepdaughter Ilse, who then acted as his secretary, wrote to the publisher and asked them to forego the royalties in these two cases, and Albert Einstein was willing to do the same. As far as I know, this 
did not, all these did not materialize. Now, uh, there was an extensive effort by the staff of the library, the library staff in Dahlem to find out whether Einstein's letter to Fivek authorizing them to produce a Braille script edition of this booklet, whether that materialized, we do not know. I will say, as I said, a lot about these, these foreign translations, but before that, I want to say something about the booklet itself, the structure and the contents. So, at the beginning when it was published, there were two parts. First was the special theory of relativity, the second part was the general theory of relativity. A year later, actually the fifth edition, he added a third part. And that is the consideration on the universe as a whole. In the same year, he also added two appendices supplementing some mathematical, uh, mathematical uh, information about how these transformations are, are derived. But then the interesting, the really interesting additions, the appendices that he added much later. Uh, two years later, is the, uh, there is an appendix, an extensive appendix, and I shall not talk about this one, but I shall talk, I shall rather say a few words about the other two appendices. The structure of space, according to the general theory of relativity, and I will devote some time to discussing the fifth appendix, which he wrote in 1952 and was first published in the English and German editions in 1954. And I try to convince you that this appendix is a standalone, a unique, important, very sophisticated document, which may also have been overlooked in the Einstein uh, scholarship. So what can we say about this, uh, about, about the style of this? Uh, uh, this booklet is Einstein's attempt to enable the general reader with no background in physics, to grasp and appreciate the grandeur of this great of this great discovery, and as Einstein himself puts it, to give him or her a few happy hours of suggested thought. Now Einstein appeals to the reader's con uh, intuition. There are a few scattered equations, but hardly any. And it is maybe almost the first time that he extensively uses such metaphors as trains and embankments and these creatures on <laughs> crawling on curved surfaces and several others. Occasionally, the style is a style of posing a question to the reader and letting either the reader or Einstein himself answering those questions, and these styles look more like a one-sided platonic dialogue. Now, Einstein's attempt was to produce something that is excessive, that is generally understood. He partly succeeded, but it is not a popular book in the usual sense. There are many jokes which he himself sarcastically uh, expressed, he said that the Gemein verständlich in the title should be replaced, replaced by Gemein unverständlich. And he said that the popular should be replaced by popular to the physicists. But still he struggled. And that struggle, there was a certain price to it. He describes in a very fascinating <coughs> style and beautifully certain basic topics like geometry and truth in geometry to which uh, Diana referred, like ge the role of geometry, geometry of gravitation, a more sophisticated topic he also describes very elegantly and that is how the meaning of coordinates, space and time coordinates 
changes as we go from special to general relativity. He also describes beautifully the notion of the field, but he does not talk about the Riemann curvature ters tensor. He does not even mention ge the geodesic line, and therefore he does not fully convey the, uh, the nature, the mathematical essence and the elegance of general relativity. Still, there are many, many aspects which, as I said, are fascinating. And let me say just a few words about uh, cosmology and then about the fifth, the fifth appendix. Now, at that time, uh, before Einstein, nothing reliable could be said about, about the universe as a whole. But Einstein very quickly, after completing his theory, realized that it can be applied to the initial consideration of the universe as a whole. There were no observations. But general relativity imposed certain mathematical constraints of, on what one can do or not do. For example, Einstein was, was convinced that the universe is static and there is a quasi-homogeneous distribution of matter in the universe. General relativity does not have such solutions because matter attracts each other, so it's dynamic. So he introduces this cosmological constant, which is essentially equivalent to a weak repulsive force to balance that. Now he describes this static universe in, in this part. He also has a beautiful description for the first time, a beautiful uh, discussion of a finite but unbounded universe, which he demonstrates with these two-dimensional creatures living on a, on, a, a, on a curved surface. But then he adds, in 1946, he adds for one of the English editions this appendix. And this, in this appendix, he has to acknowledge that one has to, to abandon his static universe because of the uh, Friedman, uh, uh, Friedman solutions, dynamical solutions, which initially, when they appeared in 1922, he discarded as calculational errors. And even five years later, when Lemaitre found his dynamical solutions, he also ignored them. It's only with the Hubble observations that he, uh, that he abandons the static, uh, his static picture of the universe, and with that, his cosmological constant. And it is beautifully, elegantly described in this appendix. But I want to say something about, about the, uh, the last one. Now, the changing concept of space. That was added to the 16th German and the 15th English edition. And in the preface to that edition, Einstein wrote, I wish to show that space-time is not necessarily something to which one can ascribe a separate existence independently of the actual objects of physical reality. Physical objects are not in space but these objects are physically extended. In this way, the concept empty space loses its meaning. Now, it's very interesting to follow how he argues and how he explains that, how those ideas evolve in this appendix. This appendix, by the way, is a standalone essay. It does not belong here. It is very different in style. It is no way popular. It is very sophisticated. It is epistemological and philosophical, more than anything else in the booklet. Why did he decide to put it in there? It's at the late age, short before his death. Five years after he wrote his autobiographical notes. There is nothing in the past that he wrote explained the way he did it here. Maybe that is our conjecture, that he decided to put it 
to include it in this booklet because he was still impressed with the popularity, with the interest, with the public influence that this booklet had. So he put it here. And this, this uh, appendix may truly be uh, viewed as his epistemological <coughs> testament or legacy. Now, there is something there, the basic points. There is something there which we have not found anywhere in his writing very extensively. He describes Descartes' notion of space. And Descartes' notion of space is making the connection between matter and space. It is the objects that are extended, and there is no space without extended objects. And the whole point in this appendix is first to explain this in great detail, in a fascinating style, to explain this notion, this idea, and then to show how general relativity redeems Descartes' philosophical, epistemological notion of space. And then there is a long discussion of the psychological origins of the concepts of space, time, uh, space enclosed in a box, events, etc., etc., and a very long discussion of the concept of field. And field initially in physics appears in the context of continuous distribution of matters and properties of matters uh, of matter in the field, and gradually it is emancipated from matter and it has a meaning and a, a broad meaning of its own. And then finally he shows that space-time does not claim existence on its own, but only as a structural quality of the field, and that is modern interpretation of Descartes' idea. Now, it's an extensive, a long paper, but what, what fi I find very fascinating in this paper also, in this appendix also, is the concluding page. And in the concluding page, he makes two profound remarks, very personal remarks. One remark about his quest, his unsuccessful, ongoing, stubborn attempts to find this unified field theory, and the other one is something about quantum physics. And the way he does it, the concluding remarks, first he says, it is common to all the, these attempts to all these, should be these attempts, to conceive physical reality as a field. These attempts are his attempts to find the unified theory. One which is a generalization of the gravitational field and in which the field law is a generalization of the pure gravitational field. And by this I mean a theory which describes exhaustively physical reality. Now, physical reality is the key word here, because he then asks if, if it's possible at all to achieve that goal. And now, he is, this time, he does not criticize quantum mechanics itself, but he criticizes the physics community that it almost unanimously abandons <laughs> this idea and the... Uh, and the conviction prevails that the experimentally assured duality of nature can be realized only by weakening the concept of reality and his own, and this is the last sentence in this booklet, maybe the last sentence that he wrote on such matters, I think that such a far-reaching theoretical renunciation is not for the present justified, and that one should not desist from pursuing the past of the relativistic field theory, and it is because of this that we uh, refer to this as his uh, epistemological, uh, epistemological legacy. And let me now uh, conclude with this part and move to describe the different translations. Uh, 
And here there is, everyone is a story in itself. But at the end you will see that there is something, there is, there is something in common and that we shall then summarize. Now the first one was the English translation. And Einstein was approached by, by, uh, approached by Robert Lawson, a lecturer in physics in Sheffield University, asking him for permission, suggesting to him, I mean, he suggested many other things, but uh, we don't have the time to uh, discuss it, just to translate this booklet. And Einstein agreed, and as, we, as Einstein was, and uh, 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 also, uh, he also agreed to write an article about about relativity for nature. And here is an interesting, as I told you, I will also share with you some anecdotal material. So here is a letter from Lawson to Einstein telling him the description of the content has to be as intelligible as possible to the ordinary man. Our travelers tell us that there is complete ignorance a good many people seem to think that the book deals with the relations between the sexes. <laughs> Relativity. Perhaps you would explain the meaning of the world and say something about the epoch-making character of the book and how Einstein's discovery affects Newton's law. Most people have heard about Newton and his apple, and that will give some kind of a clue if you relate. So, uh, again, uh, the English translation appeared uh, simultaneously in England and in the United States and had many, many editions uh, following that until today, by the way. There are coming editions and Peter already announced that there will be a new one, uh, but it is not just an edition. The text that we wrote exceeds the text of the booklet. Uh, to, anyway, so uh, let me say a few words about the French, the Italian, and the Spanish edition. Now, why do I lump them together? Because there is something in common in these three countries. First of all, in all these three countries, initially, uh, the interest in relativity is not in the physics community. Only Paul Langevin in France is one who, I mean, became involved at the very early beginning, and I mean specifically general relativity. Uh, uh, Poincaré <coughs> is a different story, and I'll say something about that, but uh, that's a unicum. Everywhere else, it is the mathematicians, the astronomers, particularly in Spain, the engineers, and I'll say something about it, the philosophers, and the general public. It is, I don't know, maybe to us, surprising, but interesting, how much the general public self was involved in those debates. It is because of that, this, because of this general interest, and the misunderstanding around it, that there was such a need for a popular, excessive explanation of these revolutionary ideas by the master himself. That partly explains the popularity of that booklet. So we have that. Now, uh, as I said, main interest there. Now, there are extensive public debate. There is a lot of skepticism, criticism, misunderstanding. The debates are not strictly scientific. They are influenced by ideologies. They are influenced by political attitudes. I'll give examples of that. In France, the academy organizes a, several debates, public debates. In one of those debates, one of the most prominent scientists in France, Emile Picard, was very critical he claims that it is too early to decide for or against the theory, expresses mixed feelings on the conceptions of space and time on which the special and general theories are based, refers to them as metaphysics rather than physics. Now, the other thing that is in common for these three countries, 
that in all these three cases, the booklet, our booklet, is printed, disseminated, read, shortly before Einstein's own visit there. And Einstein visits everywhere, changes almost dramatically, the attitudes and the understanding. And for example, immediately after his visit in France, uh, Einstein receives a letter from Maurice Solovin to Einstein, your efforts in Paris were in fact extraordinary. But if one takes into consideration the great results you achieved, you will admit that it was worth the effort. The standing of your theories here is entirely different now from before. And regarding personal impressions, people consider themselves very lucky to have made your personal acquaintance. Now in Italy, in Italy, something similar happens. In Italy, uh, the, the known, well-known geometer mathematician, Tullio Levicivita, Einstein's colleague with whom they corresponded, uh, uh, he is one of the leaders in all the debates and discussions. And he, uh, and one of the main themes in Italy in all those debates, and you will immediately see why, is how revolutionary was Einstein's new theory. Because to many there, the view that science may undergo a revolution is unacceptable. And Levi Civita uh, publishes a paper which is very influential, how a conservative could reach a threshold of the new mechanics. And this paper is translated into Spanish and French and discussed everywhere. And the idea is that no scientist should be fearful of the new, but researchers have to be conservative. They have to protect established paradigms and be critical of any effort to abolish a successful theory. And in this context, in, in uh, Italy, in response to this, uh, to this dissemination of this Einstein's new ideas, there is a manifesto, an appeal by astronomers, signed by prominent astronomers, that calls to save Newton's law. And to that, one of Italy's prominent mathematicians, Roberto Marcolongo, a friend of, uh, of Levi Civita, writes, the great of law of Newton is not in danger, just to pacify things. On the contrary, one of the most beautiful character characteristics of the new theories is that they conserve the glorious edifice constructed by Newton, while improving it with modifications which are qualitatively very slight, but conceptually grandiose. So now let me show you a few of the cover pages of the covers of these, uh, of these publications. And here is the Italian one. And Levi Civita initiated them. He asked Einstein for permission. And he also writes an extensive, intelligent introduction about that, about the speculative, speculative importance of relativity he emphasizes the word speculative, and we'll talk about it in the context of another introduction to the French edition. And it's so enormous that in a few years, more than 700 works, books, smaller publications, and articles have been dedicated to that. Uh, the engineer Calis is, is uh, the translator of the book who saw uh, to satisfy the natural desire of our co-patriots by a translation of the mentioned volume by Einstein, which reflects his thinking in a distinguished and faithful form. Now, let me go to the, to the French translation. Now, the French translation, there is a, it was a, translated by Madame Gouvier, who, is, who was a student of Emile, Emile Borel. Emile Borel is a mathematician, also an acting politician in, uh, uh, in France. Uh, 
And he writes, uh, there is a whole story about that because apparently Einstein promised uh, that all uh, French translations will be granted or the permission will be Maurice Solovin and Maurice Solovin protests and Einstein then says that the, uh, anyway, two years later there is a new translation by Maurice Solovin without any introdu introduction. But this one is, is a charming one because of Borel's introduction. Borel's introduction is a very long, very long essay. And in that essay, there is a lot of, there are lots of warnings and a lot of skepticism. And uh, uh, the critical remarks. For example, he says that the practical value of the theory is very limited. There is approximately the same numerical relations between the theory of relativity and the ordering mechanics as there is between the sphericity of the earth and the art of architecture. He is very skeptical about the cosmological implications claimed by general relativity, and he compares them to the attempt by microscopic beings in a droplet of water to infer their observations uh, from their observations, anything about the terrestrial globe. But you see how naive and how wrong he was in that statement. Because we, the small creatures in the droplet, in our droplet Earth, are now inferring about the whole universe and how it started and what happened. He also, uh, one has effectively, to effectively recognize that Mr. Einstein is far from being the only intellectual who has given in to the temptation to let himself go to such speculations. Then there is a long discussion, and that is referring to Poincaré, because he cannot ignore Poincaré, referring to Poincaré in, the, in, the, in that style, that all equations may have many interpretation. And maybe this one is chosen because it is the conventional one, and that uh, rings many bells to those who, who know the context. Uh, the Spanish uh, edition, again, was initiated by Ray Pastor, maybe the founder of modern mathematics, of the mathematical school in, uh, in, in Spain. Uh, it was uh, published uh, first uh, in a mathematical newspaper, then as a standalone. Uh, uh, there was a great interest in Spain uh, in, among the engineers. And the engineering schools, all of them, installed mandatory courses on relativity. And in the recommending, recommended readings for the students was Einstein's booklet. Now there is a whole of course contents because uh, uh, this is a Jesuit society, and the Jesuits get involved, and I don't have time to, to get into all these details. But let me now go to the next one, and that is very different. And that is the Polish translation. Now, in Poland, from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning, the entire physical community, the community of physicists, is deeply involved, interested, active, corresponds in, with Einstein on those, on those issues. Uh, and there are several schools. There is Warsaw, there is Lwów, and Pol Poland was divided and reunited in 1918, and all that has to do with that. And there is a very interesting man, an engineer, Maximilian Huber, who publishes this, uh, translates and publishes this book with a very, very long introduction. And in that introduction, uh, uh, first it talks about the popular. It's not popular in the usual sense. It's uh, interesting. It is popular with physicists. This booklet cannot serve as after-dinner reading, even for a scientifically educated mind. But it may provide a reader who does not spare intellectual effort, moments of deep spiritual satisfaction, which are sensed by a researcher, and so on and so on. Now, this, uh, this introduction has one element which is, which is particularly interesting. And that is 
uh, in the debates and in the reception, the role of anti-Semitism. We know the role that anti-Semitism played in Germany in, uh, in the fostering years of relativity against the theory, against its founder. Now, uh, Huber can understand that the Germans may be, they may be anti-Semitic. Prussian nationalists can be forgiven for being anti-Semitism because they have their anger for Germany's defeat. But he cannot accept that something like that would also occur in Poland. What could a judgment of scientific achievement through the prism of racial and national prejudice lead to? I observed such judgment recently on the occasion of the initial general interest in the theory of relativity in Lvov, and he hopes that this present publication and his public appearances and, and his public writings will uh, break the ice of those prejudices uh, and superstitions for the benefit of our scientific culture. And you see the patriotism here, 1918, uh, after 123 years of Polish non-existence as a state is suddenly reunited and emerges again as a state, so the reunited Fatherland. Now, the next one which deserves some attention is the Czech translation. What? Five. Five, I will finish. The Czech translation is, is, is very interesting because uh, uh, here he writes, Einstein writes an introduction, it is in Prague that he actually had these ideas the, the basic ideas about the equivalence principle, the formulation of the equivalence principle, and he describes it all in an introduction, which I shall not read to you. Um, uh, I'm glad that this booklet, uh, just the beginning, in which the basic ideas of the theory of relativity are presented without mathematical formalism, appears now in the national language of the country where I found the necessary contemplation to gradually give the general theory of relativity a more precise form. And the next one is the Russian, to which Diana referred. The translator here is Gregorius Itelson, a Jewish emigre from Russia, a philosopher whom Einstein held in very high esteem. Uh, he wrote, uh, as Diana told you, an introduction, a brief introduction to this thing. It's Itelson. Uh, this translation was not written for Russia. There was a Russian community in Germany, 400,000. They had their own publishing house that published this, this paper, and this is the next one. And uh, Itelson, by the way, I should tell you, when he was 74 years old, after that, he was beaten to death on Kurfürstendamm Street by a group of fascists screaming, beat the Jews, and Einstein himself took care of transferring part of Itzelson's family to the Hebrew, uh, of, of Itzelson's library to the Hebrew University, where it is until today, and the rest he sold to support Itzelson's daughter. And then we have the Japanese, uh, and I shall be, I, I shall skip that. I only want to tell you that Nagaoka, Hantaro Nagaoka, who knew Einstein, uh, wrote in the introduction something very nice, which I did not know about, that he quoted this classical Chinese philosophy book where it, there is a saying that if people sit in a large ship in the middle of the ship, they do not know that the ship is moving. So what else is more similar to the relativity principle? And then we have the Chinese edition, which is also uh, uh, published by uh, one of the scholars who lived in, in Germany, and I have no time to do that because I want to go to the final one. In 1928, this is the Hebrew edition. And Einstein himself, not through any publisher, corresponded with, with the translator, Jakob Greenbaum, a Jewish intellectual who lived in Vienna, who wrote in the uh, Encyclopédie des Judentums, the Jewish Encyclopedia in Berlin, 
and uh, Jacob Greenbaum uh, asked Einstein to write an introduction to this to this uh, 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 to this publication, but he did not trust Einstein. So if you look, that's why we have to see letters, Diana. <laughs> that you are right because if you look at the back of the letter, Greenbaum suggests a text. And this introduction is by word by word the text that, that he translated to him. And this is the text. Here it is in Hebrew in the publication of this book of mine in the language of our forefathers. Fills my heart with special joy. It is a sign of the change that occurred in this language. It is not confined anymore to expressing matters related to our people for our people. It's universal. And Greenbaum in his introduction also talks about the difficulty to express such ideas in an archaic language, but that is it. And this year, by the way, the uh, Magnus, the Hebrew University Press, uh, intends to have a new edition in Hebrew of this booklet translated by the brother of our chairman here, Dr. Yachin Una, so it will appear this year. So to conclude, now I, I read a few concluding remarks, because this is a short overview of some of the translations of Einstein's booklet. And that confirms what we already know, actually. What we know is that the reception of new scientific theory is not a passive absorption of information, but an active process of appropriation and often in, in an intellectual struggle. It is shaped by pre prior shared knowledge of scientific and public community by its social structure, by its degree of specialization, by the status and value ascribed to science itself in a given society. And this booklet and Einstein's theory of relativity beautifully, convincingly, demonstrates all that. And uh, Einstein's personal contribution to this shift of perspective that science has a major place, a major role in social and private life. He acted here as a cosmopolitan missionary <coughs> of science, and this cannot be overestimated. He traveled from one place to another, and the common feature of all the interactions during his travels, in his correspondence, between Einstein and the various scientific communities was the significant increase in the awareness that basic science is a global endeavor of crucial relevance to all societies. And as we have seen, this foreign language edition of the present booklet, in many cases preceded by Einstein's old visit, had a major contribution to the intellectual debates which made this process happen. Thank you very much. It's time for one or two very pressing questions, but of course there'll be more time in the coffee break. Einstein wrote, special relativity does not compel us to deny ether. Later, he wrote, General relativity without ether is unthinkable. How do you compare this because to the common knowledge <laughs> about the ether and the literature since then? And this is only one example. I can bring many more. All right. But the question is, uh, what do you mean by ether? You see, when we talk about Einstein's concept of God and that he accepted God or denied God or this, all the question, everything boils down to what he means by God. And the same thing goes, you see, the second quotation, second quotation is uh, from the lecture that he gave in Leiden on the occasion of Lawrence's uh, 60th birthday. And there, there is a whole, I mean, essay on that. And there, you see, Eter is... Ether is essentially the field. This is, I disagree. Because okay. <laughs> well, well, we, we won't, we won't you, you disagree with what? That that is what he meant, or that is what he said? No. 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 Take a practical question. Uh, 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 
whether Lorentz theory and Einstein theory are equivalent or no, then Einstein says actually that the Lorentz theory and his theory are equivalent. You don't find it in the textbooks. Okay. <laughs> This is, this is absent in the German original, yes. but it is. It is in, only in the appendix. It is not in the booklet. Yes, but it's, I know, but it's absent in the German original of the appendix. When he writes, in the he writes it in German. Uh -huh. It's in not the there. In the German manuscript. And we found, uh, Timon uh, found, and we corresponded about it, um, a little correspondence between Einstein and Lawson, where Einstein says, that sentence to be added in the English translation because he wasn't happy with Lawson's translation of what came directly before and afterwards. And he wrote it directly into English, so there's no German counterpart. But, 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 yeah, so that's an interesting observation, but Einstein did not deny it. No, no, sure, he wrote it. He was, yeah, and that's an, and that's an interesting, you see, this is this is this we find very interesting because in the autobiographical notes, which is sort of a, a summary, this is not there. I mean, nothing of that kind, nothing of that style. And this Descartes philosophy, I don't know. I am very cautious because uh, I'm quite a novice. I don't. I don't know. I don't. What? in this Encyclopedia Britannica article, and I think it shows up in lectures that he gives in South America. When I go to my room, I will do research and send it there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me add just one remark uh, in the beautiful graph of correspondence with scientists, which Diana showed us. There is, Heisenberg is missing, but it's not because he didn't write to Heisenberg but because we don't have the letters which he sent to Heisenberg. Probably they were destroyed during the war. Thank you very much. We shall reconvene in 20 minutes.